Building Science 101 is sponsored by Anderson Windows and Doors, Builders First Source, Huber Engineered Woods, Polyguard, Sashco, and View Rail. All right, my friends, Building Science 101, let's get going. Episode one, why do we build? Yeah, what a question, huh? That's, that is a loaded question. You know, when I set out to set up this series with you and talk about well, what are we going to talk about? What should that first episode be? How do we open it? I thought it was probably most important that we go right to square one. Yeah. Right? You can't, we can't talk effectively about building unless we talk about why. That's right. right? What, what are we providing the solution to? Mm -hmm. Why do we build? Now, if I had a hundred builders and, and homeowners in the crowd and I asked them, pulled them and said, hey, why do we build? Oh, I want a house. Um, I need to be in a house. Uh, I like it because it's warm in there. Um, I want to get out of the rain. I need a place to store all my stuff. Like we'd get a hundred answers, but I doubt we'd get the real answer. So what is the real answer? So Steve? the real answer, right? When we think about building, what are we really trying to do? And I always explain it as we simply don't want to be out there. Mm -hmm. We want to be in here. Yep. So what does that mean? Well, in some places it means different things than in other places. For example, in Austin, this afternoon at two o'clock, we don't want to be out there. No, it's a hundred degrees. Cause it'll be a hundred degrees. We want to be in here because it's 70 degrees. Yep. Um, it, chances are there's probably higher than comfortable humidity out there. Yep. And we don't want to be out there because of that. We want to be in here where it's cooler and the humidity is a little lower. Now, if I was in International Falls, Minnesota, in December, January, I don't want to be out there because it's freezing. So I might actually die. And I picked International <laughs> Falls because it is like one of the coldest places in the U.S. Um, and yeah, so you want to be inside. But but again, what does that mean? You can't just say, well, I want to be inside. Okay, I want to be inside. But what that really means is I want to come into a conditioned space. Mm -hmm. I want to come into a space that can be predicted. Yep. Right? So. The minute you say, well, I want to be able to predict something, well, now you're invoking science. Yeah. Right? And because this is tied to building efforts, hence the name. Building science. Building science. That's right. Right? So we build to basically put an environment inside the larger environment that we live in. Yeah, for sure. You know, my friend Christoph Irwin uses an example where he says, you know, our, our houses are a little like fish bowls where that, that goldfish is swimming around in the fish bowl and the glass separates the goldfish from, uh, you know, lack of water, which would be death for that fish. But ultimately it's an enclosure and the fish swims around in that enclosure. Uh, what do you think about that analogy? Yeah, I mean, it's it's perfect. Um, you know, it's it's an environment inside a larger environment that provides a solution for its inhabitant. In that case, it's a fish. Yeah. But, you know, I have this sketch here that it's funny you bring up that story because in in this sketch, it's a small section of a, a real simple structure, but it could very easily be a fishbowl. Yeah, that's right. Right. And, and if I draw myself in here and uh, yeah, even though I have big red... <laughs> This is the iPad version. This is the iPad red. version of Big Red. But when we draw a person in there, we're basically suggesting that I want to be somewhere inside this building science polygon. Yeah. Right? When it's 90 out here, I want it to be 70 in here. Mm -hmm. When it's zero out here, I want it to be 70 in here. Yep. I want that humidity. When it's pouring rain, I don't want to be wet. Yeah. Right. And the minute we invoke that idea of building science, well, we can't just simply draw a simple red line. We basically have to develop assemblies that can solve that problem for us. Yeah. You're basically developing condition space, right? Uh, and I'm stealing this from you, but I've heard you say we're looking for control of our environment, right? Yeah, the, the whole thing. So if we went back to your original question, hey, Steve, why do we build? I would say because we want to gain control, mm -hmm. right? And when gaining control just doesn't mean, hey, it's warm in here. We want to be able to, say, build machinery and equipment that can solve and make sure that it's 70 degrees and 
50% or 45% RH right. in there every day, every minute of the day. Yeah. And oh, guess what? If I take a walk up the stairs and I go to my kid's bedroom, I don't want it to be 80 degrees up there. That's right. Right? Because otherwise we could live in a tent and be dry, let's say, but we wouldn't be able to actually gain control of the rest of the environment around us. So we're using science to help us gain control of everything around us, not just that rain, not just that basic shelter or uh, safety from animals or robbers. Uh, we've got everything under control in our environment. But I mean, all of that certainly plays a role in it. We certainly want some structural integrity. We want, we like the security and safety features, which are also side effects or, or anecdotal um, notions of why we build also. But ultimately it's because we want control. I have a funny story. My, you know, when I was younger, we used to go to my aunt's house and she had this cape. It was definitely not insulated. <laughs> and like every night in the summertime, like, you know, my dad say, hey, let's hit, go to bed. And, I'm, and I would like give him a hard time about, I don't want to go upstairs. It's hot up there. It's like an oven. Yeah. And he'd like smack me and just say, it's summertime, kid. It's supposed to be hot, right? Uh, uh. But the reality is, is that even though air conditioning, it's been around since something like 1928, late 20s. Mm. Um, we really haven't put it in effect until the post-World War II era. Yeah. When everybody came back and there was this giant building boom, air conditioning went into the more expensive houses. Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, I don't, I don't care where you build in the United States, you're probably putting air conditioning in, even International Falls, Minnesota. That's crazy, isn't it? Putting a, it's, um, air conditioning up there and heating. When I grew up in the 70s and eight, well, when I grew up in the 80s, I should say, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, my house uh, didn't have any central air conditioning. We just had central heat. And same, even though I was in a more mild climate, uh, potentially, or a, a slightly more southern uh, exposure than you up in Boston growing up or Massachusetts, we had no AC. My parents had a window rattler in their master bedroom, but the rest of the house was whatever it was with the windows open at night. Now, one benefit of the north in some areas is that we have cooler nighttime temperatures, whereas Texas, uh, you know, it, there's months will go by where it's never below 70 degrees, even at night. So we can't just throw our windows open in July in Texas and cool the house down like we could some nights growing up in Pennsylvania. But when I was in high school, probably in the late 80s, 89, 90, uh, my parents got central air conditioning at our house in Pennsylvania. And it's funny, ever since then, uh, you know, we've all seen our cars go from having one slide dial from heat to cold, and that's all you had to condition your car to these days. Even my Chevy pickup truck has, uh, my side is 68 degrees and my wife's side is 74 degrees. Do you really think it's that much difference between the two? But it's that perception of, oh, I can really dial in the control for my environment. Yeah, and that, and that's what, the, the car people are selling, right? They're not selling what can you do, they're selling why do you wanna do it? Yeah. Like when I put, jump in that passenger seat, I wanna at least get in my mind that I am turning this up to 72. My side's cooler than your <laughs> side because I, I just want it a little cooler, but it's that perception. And you know, the same thing with houses is that, you know, you go in and you want Obviously, the, the, it's it's real. It's not quite a perception because you walk in there at 70. But when when you take places like Phoenix or Austin, say in July or August, like you really can't survive outside yeah. during the day. I mean, people yeah. do. There's guys out there roofing and stuff, which is just baffling to me. But, you know, they do it because they have to do work, but it's never really a choice. Yeah. Like, hey, let me just go sit out in the sun and bake. That's right. All afternoon, it's let me go inside and, you know, put on the TV in my nice controlled environment. That's so fascinating that you mentioned that 60 to 70 years really of good being, of really being able to condition our spaces. Because if you think about the population in North America, uh, you know, mainly population bases were in the northern states where it was a little more uh, mild in the summertime, certainly cold in the winter. And we've had more ability to heat than air condition. Let's say 100 years ago, we had fireplaces and fires. But if you look at the population growth in the South in particular, you know, Phoenix is super booming. I'd say Phoenix is on fire, both yeah. literally and figuratively. It's super hot in Phoenix. And yet the population there has grown greatly because you're right, we've only had really this 
ability to space condition to air condition in the last 50, 60 years. Same with Texas, you know, it's a hugely growing state. And a big reason about for that is that we can air condition our offices and our houses so that, uh, you know, even in extreme heat, we can be in the 70 degree range, which is very comfortable for us. And I, and I think, you know, historically, when you look at how, how the country developed, where people lived, how equipment developed, right? AC was after heating systems, right? We had coal stoves and stuff that my parents grew up with yeah, in right. their houses. So when people talk about control or conditioning, a lot of times the perspective is such that it's tied to heating environments, mm -hmm. right? And comfort is tied to heating environments. Yep. But like you just said, probably the, the highest populated areas in the last decade are Florida, Texas, and Arizona. Yeah. Undoubtedly. Massive. Right? Massive change in population. So the perspective is slightly changing. And when we talk about control, it's not, hey, you know, how do I make this house nice and warm and energy efficient? Yeah. It's, how do I make this house nice and cool? Yeah. But the understanding is in both cases, I'm purchasing raw energy somewhere. Right. And I have to convert that energy and, and either make cooling or make heating yeah. to condition that environment. But both of them are tied to this idea of control and predicted control. Yep. And what I find really interesting in my short time of 30 years in the industry, if you, if you were to graph say the start of our um, ability to create good equipment and assemblies right mm -hmm. it's it's on a nice path upward yep like we can we can build better walls now than we could build in the 50s we have better insulation techniques we also have better equipment yep right but with that comes a much higher expectation Boy, that's for sure. Expectations have definitely risen from my childhood of, oh, it'll be between 60 degrees and 90 degrees in my bedroom when I go to bed at night. And depending on that, I'll either go to bed in my underwear on top of my sheets or I'll put a huge blanket on. Uh, whereas today we have those dials on the, uh, on the car. I mean, ultimately, Steve, if we could summarize this episode one, uh, you've heard Steve and I use the word a bunch, control. That's ultimately what we're looking for. And in this series, as we uh, step out the other nine episodes, this Building Science 101 series is, is kind of like a ladder. Uh, it's, it's a stair step. Step one is control. Steve and I have nine more episodes for you. Stay tuned, guys. What Any other summary that I missed? It? No, I mean, it's, 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 we're going to be on a really interesting journey here because, you know, we, we, we talk about you, you highlight the word control every choice I'm, I'm sitting here trying to think is there a choice i make about building or as an architect that doesn't fall back to the baseline of control yeah and it's probably not everything that we put into our houses everything that we choose to operate inside our houses everything we bring in after we build the building has some level of tie back to the word control that's right. This episode of Build Science 101 brought to you by our friends at Anderson Windows. You know, this is a long-standing brand, Steve. They've been around for many, many decades. And the A-Series window they're making now is currently the most efficient, highest performing window that Anderson's ever offered. 30 years in the industry, Anderson, I remember my very first project I ever did, it had Anderson. Is that right? Yeah. So it's, it's nice that we have a company here that is now developing their performance even further. It's great to have a domestic manufacturer that is developing their line of triple glazed windows and offering that option here. And even if FIA certified, right? Meaning they've, they've got really high standards for air tightness, for water holdout. Uh, this is really a top performing window. And you still get that beauty and elegance of a really nice aesthetic, you know, the muttons and all of that wrapped into that performance. And, you know, when you're talking about windows and if you bring it back to the building science level, understand that windows are everything in our control layer, right. right? They're our water management, air management, thermal, thermal comfort, everything is wrapped up yeah. in there. And so window manufacturers are really tasked with probably the hardest job in building. Yeah, I mean, you're punching a hole in that perfect envelope that you yeah. made that's insulated, that's structurally sound, and now we got to pop a hole in it 
and make sure that that window can control all that. So this is a tough, ta tough task. And these guys do it exceptionally well because not only do they solve the building science part, but they make it look great. Yeah, for sure. Last thing I want to mention, Steve, is they make windows that you can specify as PG70 rated. Now we're not, we don't have time to get into the, what the PG stands for and what this testing looks like, but the quick and dirty is they test windows, every manufacturer does with this independent testing service, where they put wind and water up against these windows to simulate all kinds of terrible weather. And the higher the rating, the more that window is able to withstand the wind and the water from making it through the window. And a PG50 rating is already a very high rating. When you go to coastal applications, you need to go to that PG70 rating. And sometimes in the coastal regions, like if you're building in Florida, you're adding impact resistant glass as well but they can do it without the impact glass, but still the PG70 rating, which that's a great optional upgrade. That means that that window is really gonna seal tight. It's not gonna leak air. It's not gonna have water uh, coming through that window. And that's good for every region of the country. I was in a house the other day that uh, was in a dusty area and because the wind was blowing, dust was coming right through those windows and piling up uh, on the window sills. So now if we talk about a window that's PG70 rated, we're not gonna have those problems. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, they, their, their balance of performance and aesthetics is as good as it gets. For more information, you can go check these guys out on the web at andersonwindows.com. And big thanks to Anderson for sponsoring the Build Science 101 series. Let's wrap it up, guys. Thank you for joining us. Episode one, Why Do We Build? Stay tuned for episode two. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on Build Show.